Good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindu News Analysis Discussion Session by Shankar IAS Academy for the date 16th November 2021. The list of articles we are going to discuss today are displayed here. So without wasting much time, let us start today's discussion. Today, before going to the newspaper analysis, I will discuss two main questions from the 2020 GS Paper 1. In the first question, I will try and show you how to integrate current affairs in your main answer. In the second question, I will try and show you how to generate points. Remember, constructive criticism regarding this session is always welcome in the comment section. It will help me grow and it will also help me bring you better main sensor in the future. And it will also help our YouTube community grow. Interested aspirants can also post their version of the answer to these questions in the comment section. Actually, the questions that I have chosen are very broad based. So, there is no one correct answer. You can approach these questions in multiple ways. So try and post your answers so that it will also educate me about the other ways of approaching the questions. Okay. Now let us take up the first question. Let me read out the question first. Okay. COVID-19 pandemic accelerated class inequalities and poverty in India. Comment. See here the question asks us to comment. So basically we have to give our opinion regarding the statement given. You can either agree with the statement here or you can disagree with the statement. The main thing you have to do here is after giving your opinion, you have to substantiate your opinion with facts or through logic. You have to give supporting arguments to your opinion. So this is how I am going to approach this question. I personally agree with the statement. The pandemic indeed accelerated the class inequalities and accelerated poverty in our country. Now getting to the answer. Since this is a 10 marker, the word limit should be 150 words. So a good answer in my opinion here should have a good introduction. Stating your opinion, 4 or 5 points to support your opinion in the body of the answer and a conclusion to balance your opinion and stay in the middle ground. So what to write in the introduction? You can start by saying that the pandemic had indeed increased the income inequality and accelerated poverty in our country. In the introduction, you can mention the Oxfam report titled The Inequality Virus. See, this report highlighted how the pandemic stalled the economy and forced millions of poor Indians out of jobs, pushing them further into poverty. On the other hand, wealth of the Indian billionaires increased by 35% during the same period. This is how the introduction should be, according to me. It should state your opinion and a data to support it. Now going into the body of the answer. First, you have to brainstorm for various dimensions of inequality. See, in a GS answer, your answer must deal with wider aspects. See, in case of this question, if you just focus on one aspect, say for example, economic inequality alone, your answer won't fetch you more marks. So you have to focus on multiple dimensions of class inequality. You can talk about how the pandemic widened inequality in access to education, access to healthcare, gender inequality, etc. The thing is, while talking about all these aspects, you have to give supporting arguments. That's the main point. Let us start with education. When writing about education, you can mention the survey which was discussed on the 13th November Hindu News Analysis Session. The one conducted by ICRIER. The survey mentioned that only 20% of the school children had access to remote education and only 10% had access to live class. Here you can mention about the lack of internet penetration in the rural area also. Also, how the sudden disruption of midday meal scheme affected the nutrition of children. This is how you have to integrate current affairs into your answers. Okay. In case of inequality between formal and informal economy, you can mention about the same Oxfam report that highlighted that of the 122 million job losses that occurred due to the pandemic, 75% were from the informal sector. You can mention that this accelerated poverty and widened class inequality. In our July 1st news analysis session, we talked about the UN report titled COVID-19 and Tourism, which mentioned that India saw 57% fall in tourist arrivals. We know that most of the tourism sector in India falls within the informal sector. So we can link this data with the question, citing how the fall in income to the tourism sector had indeed accelerated the class divide. Okay, now moving on to health. The pandemic accelerated the class divide in access to healthcare. We all know about the oxygen scarcity that occurred during the second wave, right? We can say there was clear disparity in access to oxygen concentrators between various classes of people. 
this in turn widened class inequality also there was a clear disparity between rural and urban areas see in india 65% of the population lives in rural area but according to central bureau of health intelligence only 37% of the beds available in government hospitals across the country are in rural areas so there is a clear rural urban divide so the pandemic indeed accelerated poverty now moving on to the gender aspect see women were the most affected during the pandemic women made up just 24% of the workforce but accounted for 28% of the total job lost okay also the loss in income for women as well as their household led to reduction in food supply and women were affected more than other members of the family women from marginalized households were not able to access contraception or menstrual health related products also so in gender wise also there was a clear disparity due to pandemic okay now that we have addressed the body of the answer we shall now move to the conclusion in the conclusion you can provide some counter arguments to balance the answer so that the answer stays in the middle path see in the conclusion you can talk about various government schemes like pradhan mantri garib kalyan yojana pm swanidhi one nation one ration scheme atmanirbhar bharat rozgar yojana pradhan mantri garib kalyan rozgar yojana our recent achievements of 100 crore vaccination and increased allocation to mandrega you can say that the government took all these measures to stop accelerating poverty and end the answer in a positive note okay so this is a comprehensive answer according to me for this question you can also write your version of this answer in the comment section okay then we can have a discussion regarding that so now moving on to the next question see in this question i won't be discussing about the answer to be precise instead i will give you tips about how to generate points and how to structure your answer okay let me read out the question first account for the huge flooding of million cities in india including smart ones like hyderabad and pune suggest lasting remedial measures this question has two parts first is this account for the huge flooding on million cities for this part of the question you have to discuss about the causes of urban flooding the second part of the question is suggest lasting remedial measures for this part of the question you have to give suggestions about the measures that could be taken to mitigate urban flooding so here in the introduction you can mention about the recent urban flooding incidents in the country and uh, write some data how these incidents are becoming more frequent okay this will be a very comprehensive introduction for this question so now that we have addressed introduction part we shall now move to the first part of the answer that is causes of urban flooding here instead of just writing the causes of urban flooding randomly you can give structure to your answer using subheadings see a well structured answer will help you fetch more marks in case of this question you can divide the causes of urban flooding into two one is the natural cause the other is the man made cause this will give more structure to your answer and it will also help you generate points in a orderly fashion now moving to the second part of the question that is the remedial measures so to generate points remedial measures could be divided into three parts first is that what are the measures that could be taken before the event that is before urban flooding takes place so the second is that when the urban flooding do occurs what are the measures that could be taken and the last is that after the urban flooding occurs how we can build back better so there will be three parts and you can generate points under these subheadings so by brainstorming like this we can generate points easily and we can write a answer with a good structure you can also use the adaptation and mitigation approach to generate points in this case subheadings will have what the remedial measures could have been taken to mitigate urban flooding and then what are the remedial steps that could be taken to adapt to urban flooding so under these subheadings also points could be generated you can either use the first approach or use the second approach that is the adaptation mitigation approach to write a comprehensive answer you must always have our syllabus in our mind for example while writing about the remedial measures you must write from polity perspective where you can mention about the environment impact assessment okay for geography perspective you can talk about the better monsoon forecasting model better city zonation etc from a economic perspective you can talk about how the smart city component should have a environmental aspect built into it and from the environmental aspect you can talk about the creation of 
ஸ்பாஞ்ச் சிட்டிஸ் ப்ரிவென்டிங் வாட்டர் பாடி என்க்ரோச்மெண்ட் தென் யூ கேன் ஆல்சோ டாக் அபவுட் த சென்டாய் ஃப்ரேம் ஒர்க் சி பை அப்ரோச்சிங் திஸ் வே யூ கேன் ஈஸிலி ஜெனரேட் பாயிண்ட்ஸ் இன் ஆல் த ஆஸ்பெக்ட்ஸ் கவரிங் அ ஒய்டர் பெர்ஸ்பெக்டிவ் இன் யுவர் ஆன்சர் திஸ் வில் ஆல்சோ ஹெல்ப் யூ ஃபெச் மோர் மார்க்ஸ் ஓகே சி நாட் ஜஸ்ட் ஃபார் திஸ் கொஸ்டின் பட் ஃபார் மோஸ்ட் கொஸ்டின்ஸ் திஸ் டெக்னிக் வில் ஹெல்ப் யூ ஜென்ரேட் பாயிண்ட்ஸ் இன் அ ஸ்ட்ரக்சர்ட் மேனர் தட் இஸ் ஹேவிங் த சிலபஸ் இன் மைண்ட் அண்ட் அப்ரோச்சிங் த கொஸ்டின் வில் ஹெல்ப் யூ ஹேவ் அ ஒய்டர் பெர்ஸ்பெக்டிவ் இன் யுவர் ஆன்சர் so now moving on to the conclusion part in the conclusion part you can write the way forward where you can mention that how implementing these remedial measures will help us mitigate urban flooding see in this question you can draw maps and show what are all the areas that witness frequent urban flooding writing like this will give you a comprehensive and a well structured answer i hope this session helped you guys write better answers you can also post your suggestions regarding this session in the comment section with this let us conclude this and take up the first news article now look at these two articles see the article speaks about center's retrospective tenure extension to mr mishra who is the director of ed that is enforcement directorate these two news article speaks about ordinances that would allow center to extend the tenure of directors of cbi and the enforcement directorate and the implications of such action The article also speaks about the order issued by the personal ministry to amend the fundamental rules 1922. We shall understand here why there is a order to amend fundamental rules 1922. See the rules contain the list of services whose tenure can be extended by the central government in the context of public interest. The services in the rules are defense secretary, foreign secretary, home secretary, director of intelligence bureau director of research and analysis wing so the rules is getting amended to add cbi and the director of enforcement directorate to the list now we shall see some basic details about enforcement directorate in simple terms directorate of enforcement that is ed is a law enforcement and economic intelligence agency responsible for enforcing economic law and fighting economic crime in india It is part of the Department of Revenue under Ministry of Finance. It is composed of officers from Indian Revenue Service, Indian Police Service and Indian Administrative Service. See the origin of this directorate goes back to 1956 when the enforcement unit was formed in the Department of Economic Affairs for handling exchange control laws violations under Foreign Exchange Regulation Act 1947 that is FERA Act 1947. in 1957 it was renamed as enforcement directorate now you should understand why such a unit is formed see it is a multidisciplinary organization mandated with the task of enforcing provisions of two special fiscal laws the laws are foreign exchange management act 1999 that is fema act 1999 and the prevention of money laundering act 2002 okay Now that we have seen the basic details let us discuss the functions of enforcement directorate see it investigates contravention to the provisions of fema act 1999 and the offenses of money laundering under the provisions of prevention of money laundering act 2002 it processes the cases of fugitives from india under fugitive economic offenders act 2018 also The act is to provide measures to deter that is the fugitive economic offenders act 2018 is mainly to provide measures to deter fugitive economic offenders from evading the process of law in India by staying outside the jurisdiction of Indian courts it renders cooperation to foreign countries in matters relating to money laundering and restoration of assets under the provisions of prevention of money laundering act 2002 okay Now let us move on to see the next organization which is the Central Bureau of Investigation. See the CBI traces its origin to the Special Police Establishment. See this Special Police Establishment was set up in 1941 by the British government. So the function of the Special Police Establishment was to investigate cases of bribery and corruption in transactions with the War and Supply Department during World War 2. even after the end of the war the center felt the need to investigate the bribery cases of its employees so the delhi special police establishment act was established in 1946 
the Delhi Special Police Establishment Act acquired its current name that is Central Bureau of Investigation through a Home Ministry resolution in 1963 it investigates offenses under Prevention of Corruption Act 1988 Indian Penal Code etc see the CBI is headed by a director and he is provided with the security of tenure of 2 years by the Central Vigilance Commission Act 2003 now that we have seen the genesis of cbi we shall see what it does or what are the functions of cbi see cbi deals with offenses by central government employees employees of public sector undertaking and public sector banks its jurisdiction is also extended to union territories and can be extended to states with the consent of the concerned state government the important point to be noted here is that the cbi needs prior approval of the central government before conducting enquiry into offenses committed by officers of rank of joint secretary or above it investigates crime having national or international ramifications committed by criminal gangs also it also coordinates the activities of anti corruption agencies and the state police forces and finally it maintains crime statistics and disseminates the criminal information so these are all the functions of central bureau of investigation so up until now we saw about the basic background of the organization mentioned in the article see these data will help you in the prelims perspective okay now we shall discuss the issues given in the article the main issue is that the recent ordinances extending the tenure will compromise the autonomy of the organization the prospect of getting extension will become a incentive to display regime loyalty in discharge of duties so this is the main concern see the supreme court has laid down in the vinit narayan vs union of india case 1997 that the directors of central bureau of investigation and the enforcement directorate should have a minimum tenure of 2 years the protection given by a fixed tenure and use of a high ranking committee to recommend appointments and transfer were meant to dilute the doctrine of pleasure implicit in civil service but it should be noted here that the dilution of doctrine of pleasure may be breached if the extension allowed through the ordinances instead of becoming an exception becomes a rule so now what is doctrine of pleasure see the doctrine of pleasure has its origin in england This doctrine is a special prerogative of the British Crown. In England, a servant of the Crown holds office during the pleasure of the Crown. Okay? The tenure of a civil servant can be terminated at any time without assigning any cause. The Crown is not bound by any special contract between it and the civil servant. Now let us see the doctrine of pleasure in Indian context. In Indian constitution, the doctrine of pleasure is embodied in Article three ten, the article states that except for the provisions provided in the Constitution, a civil servant of the Union works at the pleasure of the President, and a civil servant under the State works at the pleasure of the Governor of that State. Here in Indian context, the power is not absolute. So when there is a specific provision in the Constitution giving a tenure to a civil servant. then the servant could be excluded from the operation of doctrine of pleasure see for example article 124 provides tenure to the judges of supreme court so through article 124 the judges are excluded from the doctrine of pleasure okay see this exclusion from the doctrine of pleasure ensures autonomy so this is at stake now okay so hope you guys understood the concept discussed here now with this let us conclude this session and take up the next article see this here is a science based article the syllabus related to this article is given here for your reference this article speaks about the role of micro rnas in cancers that originate from lymphocytes immune system cells by examination of genome wide expression and functional analysis of micro rnas during lymphoid lineage commitment this work has been done by department of animal biology university of hyderabad let us see some basic details for better understanding of this concept see micro rnas are endogenous small non coding rnas that function in the regulation of gene expression micro rnas are short rnas which bind to target messenger rnas resulting in translational repression and gene silencing 
and are found in all eukaryotic cells. Approximately 2200 microRNA genes have been reported to exist in mammalian genome from which 1000 belong to human genome. Many major cellular functions such as development, differentiation, growth and metabolism are known to be regulated by microRNAs. Now we shall discuss the characteristics of microRNAs. See microRNAs are short RNA sequence that repress protein synthesis by either inhibiting the translation of messenger RNA or increasing messenger RNA degradation. See endogenous microRNAs have been found in various organisms including animals, plants and viruses. The majority of microRNAs are located within the cell but there is an exemption. See some microRNAs are circulating microRNAs or extracellular microRNAs. See these RNAs have been found in extracellular environment including various biological fluids and cell culture media. These extracellular microRNAs have been widely reported as potential biomarkers for variety of diseases and they also serve as a signaling molecules to mediate cell-cell communications. Okay. Now let us see the significance of microRNAs. See microRNAs are critical for normal animal development. MicroRNAs have a key role in the regulation of distant processes in mammals. Also microRNAs play a evolutionarily conserved development role and diverse physiological function in an animal body. They regulate a wide array of biological processes including carcinogenesis. See in cancer cells microRNAs have been found to be heavily dysregulated. So microRNAs may function as either oncogens or tumor suppressors under certain conditions. See tumor suppressor genes are normal genes that slow down cell division, repair DNA mistake or it tells cells when to die. That is the role of tumor suppressor genes. So when this tumor suppressor genes don't work properly, cells can grow out of control which can lead to cancer. So the other type of microRNA is oncogene. Oncogene is a gene that is mutated from a gene involved in normal cell growth. Oncogenes can cause growth of cancer cells. Okay. So mutations in genes that become oncogenes can be inherited or they also can be developed when we are exposed to an environment that causes cancer. Okay. So finally let us see what is oncomers. See an oncomer is a microRNA that is associated with cancer. Okay. So with this we have seen some basic details about microRNA. I think this will be very useful for your prelims perspective. So with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the next article. Now look at this news article. This news article mentions a very important topic. It discusses the role of tribal communities in the struggle for independence. See, what happened is, on November 10, 2021, the Union Cabinet, which is chaired by the Prime Minister, approved the declaration of November 15th as the Janjatiya Gaurav Divas. See, this day is dedicated to the remembrance of heroic tribal freedom fighters so that future generation will be aware of their contribution to the country. If you remember, several tribal communities including Santals, Tamars, Kohls, Bills, Kasis and Mizos contributed to India's freedom struggle. In that line, Birsa Munda, who was a tribal freedom fighter belonging to the Munda tribe, played a key role in raising awareness among the tribal people. See, in this discussion, we are going to see about these two things. First, we will discuss about the Janjatiya Gaurav Divas. Next, we will discuss about the contributions made by Birsa Munda. The syllabus covered by this article is highlighted here for your reference. See, most of us think the 1857 revolt was the first major show of resistance against the British. But there were many incidents before the 1857 revolt that indicated all was not well and it also indicated that the discontent towards the alien power was rising and rising. This dissatisfaction was expressed in a number of outbursts of resistance by various groups of people in various parts of India. The uprisings by tribal community are one such example. See, by fighting for their cause, they actually strengthened India's freedom struggle and inspired Indians all over the country as well. However, the public at large is not much aware of these tribal heroes. 
So in response, the government of India has sanctioned 10 tribal freedom fighters museum across the country. Apart from this, the government of India has also planned to celebrate a week long affair starting from 15th November to 22nd November 2021 to celebrate and commemorate the 75 years of glorious history of tribal people, their culture and their achievements. Not only that, the 15th of November has been designated as Janjatiya Gaurav Divas. As I already said, this day is dedicated to the memory of brave tribal freedom fighters so that coming generations would know about their sacrifices to the country. The 15th of November is notable for another reason. See, this date is the birth anniversary of Birsa Munda. So now who is this Birsa Munda? See, Birsa Munda is a tribal freedom fighter belonging to the Munda tribe. Munda is a tribal group that lived in Chota Nagpur. See, Birsa was born in the year 1874. Though he lived a very short span of 25 years, he aroused the tribal mindset and mobilized them against the British rulers. The life history of Birsa Munda will go down in the history of tribals as a story of emancipation of his own people, who had been oppressed by the British for a very long time. He is a visionary and he realized that the Britishers have come to this land to torture the masses and carry the wealth abroad. See, the Mundas followed the Kuntkati system of joint land holding. Now, you may wonder, what is this Kuntkati system? See, the Kuntkati system of the Mundas was uh, actually a joint ownership or holding of land by tribal lineage. The Mundas usually cleared the forest and made the land fit for cultivation. So, the land belonged to the whole clan and not to a particular individual. Now, what the British did is, they replaced this egalitarian system with the exploitative Zamindari system. So, outsiders entered the tribal landscape and started exploiting the Munda tribe. They were compelled, that is the Munda tribal people were compelled to work as forced labors on their own land. Poverty engulfed them like a suffocating chain and it was at this time the great famine of 1895 broke out. So, Birsa Munda led the tribals primarily to prevent non-tribals from taking land and forcing them to work as bonded labors on their own property. He organized his first protest march for remission of forest dues. Apart from this, in 1894, Birsa announced his declaration against the British and the Dikus, that is the outsiders, and he took the path of Ulgulan, that is the path of revolt. Birsa claimed to have vision of God and proclaimed himself as a prophet. He called upon the Mundas to fight against superstition, to give up animal sacrifice, to stop taking intoxicants and to retain the tribal tradition of worshipping the sacred grove. So, this movement was indeed a revivalist movement which sought to purge the Munda society of all foreign elements and restore its original pure character. This is a very important rebellion of the tribal people among the various uprising of tribals and peasants in India in the 19th century. During this struggle, he managed to bring the tribal community under a single umbrella and asked them to re-establish their own kingdom. Birsa also advocated the tribal people to reject the missionaries and return to their own tribal ways. He also asked people not to pay taxes. In 1895, for these reasons, he was arrested and he was again released in 1897 after two years. He again resumed his activity. In 1899, he resumed his armed struggle along with the people he has organized. So, in this struggle, he raised police station, government property, churches and even houses of zamindars. Finally, the British caught him in 1900 from Jamkopai forest and later he was jailed. Birsa Munda died on June 9th, 1900 while lodged at the Ranchi Central Jail while at the age of just 25. The British declared that Birsa Munda died of cholera. So now what are the results of this Munda rebellion? That was also known as the Great Tumult. First is that the government recognized the Chota Nagpur Tenancy Act of 1908. The second is that the government recognized the Kuntkati rights of the tribals. The government also banned the Bath Beggary, that is the forced labor that was imposed upon the tribals. Finally, the leader of the Munda rebellion, that is Birsa Munda, became a legend among the tribals of Chota Nagpur and became a symbol of anti-feudal and anti-colonial struggle. 
See, presently, Birsa Munda is worshipped as Bhagavan in the state of Jharkhand. So, why is Munda rebellion so important among all the tribal rebellions? See, this rebellion created awareness about the political reality of the colonial state. Okay? And another important character of this rebellion is that this rebellion not just focused on the Dikkus, who are their immediate enemies, but also fought against the entire British Raj. It was this political awareness and ability to connect to the broader political reality which made both the Munda rebellion great and Birsa Munda a legend. So with this, let us conclude this discussion and move on to the next news article. I have chosen this open article for our discussion. See, recently in the month of September, the European Union unveiled the European Union Strategy for Cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. And this open article is written in the backdrop of this strategy. Now in this context, let us see about the Indo-Pacific, its relationship with the EU, the strategy adopted by the European Union and the important points mentioned in the article. The syllabus covered by this open article is highlighted below for your reference. First, know that the Indo-Pacific region refers to a region which spans from the east coast of Africa to the Pacific island states. And it includes the world's four big economies, that is USA, China, Japan and India. This region represents the world's economic and strategic center of gravity. See, the European Union and the Indo-Pacific are highly interconnected, with the European Union being the top investor in the region. And not just that, the European Union is also the leading development coordination partner and one of the biggest trading partners in the Indo-Pacific region. In fact, together, the Indo-Pacific and the Europe hold over 70% of the global trade in goods and services as well as over 60% of foreign direct investment flows. Okay. Moreover, the European Union and the Indo-Pacific are natural partners. And the European Union is already a significant player in the Indian Ocean littoral states the Asian region and the Pacific Island states. So with passing time, the Indo-Pacific is becoming more strategically important for the European Union. And over the years, the European Union has consistently made significant contributions in the region in multiple ways, like in terms of developmental cooperation, humanitarian assistance, assistance in tackling climate change, assistance in tackling biodiversity loss, and assistance in controlling pollution. Okay, So, the current dynamics in the Indo-Pacific region has given rise to intense geopolitical competition. And this impacts the European Union's relations and the role in the region. As we know, the major issue which is of striking importance in the region is the US-China strategic contestation. Apart from this, there are a lot of alignments and groupings emerging as well. And the significant among them are the development of the Quad comprising Australia, Japan, India and the United States and AUKUS consisting of Australia, the United Kingdom and the United States. In addition to this, the European Union has also got many other events to cope up with. Important among these are the rise of China and the other Asian economies and the tensions caused by China's aggressiveness along its borders. So at such a juncture, it becomes imperative for the European Union to make some move to show its presence and to tell the world that it is still active and aware of the things that is happening around the Indo-Pacific. So on that line, the present announcement of the European Union strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific in September this year is a notable initiative. Before moving on to the strategy adopted by the European Union, just to know that the European Union is aiming at maintaining a free and open Indo-Pacific for all, while at the same time to build a strong and lasting partnership with the members in the region. So basically we can say that the European Union attempts to deepen its engagement with its partners in the Indo-Pacific in order to respond to the emerging dynamics that is affecting the regional stability of the Indo-Pacific. It tries to focus on the security and development dimension of the region that is the Indo-Pacific and also to achieve this purpose, the strategy aims to enhance European Union's engagement across a wider spectrum. And the strategy mainly highlights 
seven priority areas for European Union action. They are sustainable and inclusive prosperity, green transition, ocean governance, digital governance and partnership, connectivity, security and defense, and human security. Apart from these seven priority areas, the other European Union's vision or the principles of engagement with the Indo-Pacific partners is given below. Aspirants can read through it. Okay. See, though the European Union's security and defense capabilities are quite limited when compared to United States and China, but still it has got a great potential as a major economic power. However, to fully exercise this potential, the European Union should first be ready to share its financial resources and new technology with the partners in the Indo-Pacific. Not one big drawback with the European Union is that it suffers from marked internal divisions. See, for example, let's take China. See, among the European Union itself, there are many states which view China as a great economic opportunity. On the other hand, there are also other states in the European Union which view China as a threat. Therefore, the European Union first needs to follow a internally coordinated approach for a more successful external relationship. See, the European Union's policy is a welcome step for India. Mainly, the central position which India holds in the region demands a closer India-European Union partnership. And the recent meeting between the India and European Union leaders has given hopes for fostering new synergies between the two that is India and the European Union. So to conclude, the European Union can actually secure for itself a good position in the Indo-Pacific if it adopts a practice of becoming more candid with itself and by becoming more assertive with China and lastly by choosing to be more cooperative with India. And uh, with this, let us wind up this OPAD article discussion. Now we have completed our news analysis section and now let us take up the practice prelims questions. Look at the first question. Let me read out the question first. Consider the following statements regarding microRNA and choose the incorrect option from below. The first statement. MicroRNAs are endogenous, small, non-coding RNAs that function in regulation of gene expression. Second statement. Endogenous microRNAs have been found only in plants. Third statement. In cancer cells, microRNAs have been found to be heavily dysregulated. Fourth statement. MicroRNAs are located within the cell and also in extracellular environment. So from our discussion, we know that statement 2 is incorrect because endogenous microRNAs have been found in various organisms including animals, plants and viruses. And uh, the rest of the statements are correct. So the correct answer is option B. Okay. Now moving on to the second question. Let me read out the question first. Consider the following statements regarding Central Bureau of Investigation. The first statement. The Central Bureau of Investigation investigates offences cases of only central government employees. The second statement. President appoints the Director of Central Bureau of Investigation. We have to choose the correct statements from the quotes given below. See, actually, the statement one is incorrect because Central Bureau of Investigation deals with offences by central government employees, employees of public sector undertakings and public sector banks. Its jurisdiction is also extended to union territories and can be extended to states with the consent of the concerned state government. So the first statement is incorrect. And the second statement is also incorrect because in 2004 the Lokpal Act provided a committee for the appointment of CBA director. See this committee is headed by the Prime Minister. The other members of the committee are leader of opposition or the leader of the largest opposition party and the third member is chief justice of india or a supreme court judge appointed by the chief justice of india so the second statement is also incorrect so since both the statements are incorrect the correct option is option d neither one or two The main question based on today's discussion is displayed here. Do write the answers and post it in the comment section. So if you like today's discussion, do like, comment and share. And do subscribe to Shankara Ace Academy YouTube channel. Thank you.